All right, everybody, let's get on with working on polynomials. <clears throat> we mentioned in class the other day that um, there are two ways that you can kind of look at an equation or a, at a particular um, um, function or whatever. And one is by looking at the equation. And we know in order for something to be a polynomial, it can't have negative exponents, it can't have fractions, and it can't have absolute value. There's some other stuff that can't have like a square root, but when you get down to it, the square root means that it had a fraction exponent. It can't have an X in the denominator, but when you get down to that, that mathematically means you can't have a negative exponent. So you can, a lot of times, look at an equation and say, yeah, that guy's a polynomial, or no, it's not a polynomial. And you're just gonna do that by looking and saying, what the heck's going on with, um, with the exponents is what we're looking at, okay? So um, you can also look at the graph. That's another way to deal with it. You can't have sharp corners and you can't pick up your pencils. So what we mean by that is one of the ones we really like to use is a parabola, right? We know, oh, that's a not, not a pretty parabola, I'm sorry. Ugh. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't know why it didn't come out the way I wanted it to. Y equals X squared. That's the parent function for that, right? The original. And then we do other stuff to it, but basically it's a nice, pretty smooth graph. It doesn't have any points. It doesn't start and stop. Um, as long as you don't have this mess in here that Dr. Webster just did. Um, and so that is a polynomial. And we know that this guy is even. So we're actually going to use y equals x squared as our exam example as we go forward for what happens with even exponents, um, even graphs. Because you'll have some other guys that look like this. Maybe it's this guy, okay? He comes from y equals x to the fourth. Now, other stuff may be going on in there. It's probably like some plus or minus junk stuff back there. We know things happen, things shift, things stretch, all of that stuff. But the original function is y equals x, fourth, x to the fourth. And I know this because it goes one, two, three, four directions. Okay, four directions. That's what I'm after here. This one was x squared. Sorry, that's my alarm. This one's x squared because it went one, two directions. Okay. And so both of those are even, and you'll notice that they're both got coefficients out in the front that are positive. So what we say is we want to look at these things as if they were f of x equals and some a out in front, right? We don't know what that coefficient guy would be, x to the n, okay? So if n is even, then the graph acts like That's like an even graph. Even after we may have shifted it or stretched it or whatever we may have done, it's still going to graph like an even graph. So in other words, when I pick up this parabola and I move it over five and I move it up three, it's now a parabola up here, but it still looks like a parabola, right? The shape doesn't change just because I moved it and it's no longer even, okay? It's, it's, it's gonna have some plus or minus, maybe five X plus three or something like that going on in the background, okay? And we know that this A guy right here, we know it's a, a vertical stretch. It tells me how tall the guy is, but it also tells me, and we call it the end behavior. Okay, it also tells me the end behavior. And what that means is, if it's positive, then we know that this um, parabola in this case, or this W shape, which is X to the fourth, is going to be facing up, okay? 
So positive A means parabola turned up. Okay, but we know that if that was a negative sitting out there, so if it's a negative A, that it means the parabola is upside down, right? Okay, so for instance, if I had something like y equals negative x squared plus or blah, 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 a bunch of junk out there, okay? We don't know what's going on, like where it's been moved or shifted or anything like that, but because this is a negative number out here, it means it's an upside down parabola, right? So this guy, draw him up, draw him down, y equals negative x squared plus some stuff. Who cares what that stuff is? We don't care, okay? And same thing with my x to the fourth guy, right? If he was a negative, y equals negative x to the fourth plus some junk back there, okay? Maybe it's, I don't know, minus five x to the third, blah, blah, blah. That would move it off of the origin, but I'm gonna still put it right here. It's still gonna behave like x to the fourth, it's just going to be upside down. So as I trace this, again, I put my pencil down, I trace it up, down, up, down. It goes four directions, okay? And as it's doing this up, down, up, down, we realize it's an upside down W now, right? It looks more like an M. So that's because of this leading coefficient the guy out in front of the x to the fourth, he was a negative, right? And this guy out in front of the x squared, he was a negative. So when it's negative, it just flips it upside down. So that changes what we call the end behavior, right? Sorry, that's up above, right there. So that guy out in front, if he's positive or negative, tells me the end behavior. Is the parabola right side up or is it upside down? Okay, that's what we're after. And we're basically going to use x squared as my guy to tell me what's going on. If you actually graph, by the way, let me do this for us real fast. If I actually graphed, oops, got to get the right spot and clear out the stuff that I have in my calculator. If I graph x squared, right, there he is, we know that's going to be a parabola. If I graph x to the fourth, x raised to the fourth power, oops, sorry, x raised to the fourth power, there we go. If I graph x to the fourth, um, we know that if it's got a bunch of junk behind it, that it's going to make it bounce around more. Okay, that's what I've been telling you. But the original graph, before he bounces around, before I've got the plus 3x squared or whatever, I'll show you that one in a second. But the original graph, that guy um, looks a lot like a parabola. He's just a little flatter in the middle. So let's graph these and see. Here's the original and look at that. So the x to the fourth guy, he flattens out more here, but he looks a lot like the parabola. And the reason why is because he doesn't have a bunch of stuff behind him yet um, that's making him bounce around. So let me show you that. What if it was like plus three x to the third, minus five x squared, plus eight x, plus 12. I don't know what this is going to look like because I just made it up, but I know it's going to bounce around a lot more because it's got all that stuff behind it. It's not going to look like a parabola anymore. So there's the parabola. Look at that guy. Up, down, up, down. And if I made him fit, well, it doesn't like that because it's way out, but there he is. Okay. So I don't actually see a lot of bouncing, but I definitely see that it moved off of the um, off the origin, right? So stuff did happen in there. I'm not seeing it move around. We'll have to find one. Um, let me just get rid of one of those terms, maybe. Just to see if it bounces more. 
No, it's still looking kind of like a shallow, shallow parabola. It should be bouncing around more in here. But what we know is that he should be going because he's x to the fourth, four different directions. And while I'm on that, <clears throat> let me just add a little piece here. Talk about the turning points because we've talked a little bit about vertex and stuff like that, number of turning points and stuff like that. When it's x squared, there's only one turning point, right? And it is the vertex. So it comes down and it hits this vertex. Well, it should be at zero, zero, right? And it goes back up. That was my cruddy graph, sorry. Okay, but this one, it's going up. It hits that vertex and then it's going back down, right? Okay, still one turning point, even though it's upside down. This one, we said it will eventually have four directions on it. That means there's always one less than the number of directions or one less than the exponent for the turning points. So three turning points. Okay, one here, one here, and one here, right? So three turning points. So that's not going to be the exponent is four. We're going to subtract one, right? It's not going to be the same as the exponent. The, the directions one, two, three, four is the same as the exponent, but the number of turning points is one less. So only three. Absolutely. Okay, so same thing here. If it's upside down, it doesn't matter. It's one, two, three, four directions and one, two, three turning points. Okay. So those are little things we can pick up from just looking at the degree of the polynomial, which is just the leading exponent right here. There's my degrees. So we're going to talk about how the overall graph is going to look. Now, it may do weird stuff in the middle right here in the center and bounce around and blah, 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 blah. But the end behavior, we're going to be able to talk about it just by looking at What's the exponent and what's the leading coefficient, okay? So that's why we don't need all this other plus stuff back here behind it. This is what we look at to determine what's going on overall in the graph. Okay, now both of those were even. So what if it was odd, okay? If it was odd, then we're gonna start with stuff like y equals x cubed. And again, it can have a plus and a bunch of junk going on back there, okay? And if you want to, you can graph these, just the basic um, graphs to see what's going on. So here we go, y equals x cubed, okay? And y equals, I'll just pick like x to the seventh because that's another odd guy. We're not gonna worry about all the stuff that could be added or subtracted or whatever to mess it up, okay? That makes it bounce around more in the middle. We're just worried about what the overall graph looks like. And the thing is, we know, hopefully, that x cubed is like an S curve, right? It comes up, it just flattens out at the origin, and then it goes up again. But the question is, what do you think x to the seventh is going to do? And in my head, I hope you are saying it's going to be similar, okay? Especially since it doesn't have stuff in the back, it's not bouncing around yet, okay? So let's graph these and see. Oh, let me change my, I'm sorry. <laughs> This is because I zoomed in. I'll zoom standard six. That's my normal graph. Okay. All right. There we go. The original came up and it went like that. And the x to the seventh came up and it flattened out a little bit more. It looks a little steeper. Okay. And that's because of that exponent, but it looks basically the same, right? There may be weird stuff's happening right here in the middle. Maybe it's flattening more or it's bouncing more or whatever. It just depends on what I'm adding in the background, right? But the overall shape of the graph is the same. So what we see with these hopefully is <clears throat> when I go to graph one of these, if it's a positive, it's going to be rising, right? It's gonna start at the bottom, it comes up, it kind of flattens at the origin, and then it goes up some more, okay? So this one isn't, so when we had the, Remember, even guys, they originally, even functions are originally symmetric around the y-axis, right? So they've got this nice, I, I'm going to drop and then I'm going to go back up. And we always end up in the same direction, right? So I started at the top, go down, go up, go down. 
end up at the top, right? So those end up looking like parabolas, okay? But this guy, he is symmetric around the origin. Remember the difference in the evens and the odds? Before I move him off, before I start adding stuff in the back and all that kind of stuff. So the, the overall graph of this, this guy and anything that's an odd function. So if you graph y equals x to the fifth, y equals x to the seventh and so on, y equals x to the ninth. All of those start out as e odd functions and they all have symmetry around the origin. So they're all gonna start out looking like this. And I can consider that they're going in opposite directions, right? This one starts at the bottom, this side ends at the top, okay? So that's what all of them are gonna look like. Now. Once I start adding stuff and multiplying by stuff, this may shift off. It may not be odd anymore, right? If I move it up and down or side to side, it's not gonna necessarily be odd anymore because it's not symmetric around the origin anymore. But the graph still looks like an odd function overall, okay? It's still going to start at the bottom, go up and end at the top, unless what? something about this leading coefficient, right? Again, what if we had y equals negative x cubed, okay? We should know what does this negative make it do? Okay, and again, hopefully I'm hearing in my head you say, it flips it around the x-axis, Dr. Webster, which is absolutely what happens when I have a leading coefficient with a negative out there, right? So. What that means is that this piece that's going up here is going to be coming down here. I'll do it in red so we can see the difference, hopefully. Okay, it's gonna be coming down here. It's gonna be under the x-axis. And this piece that's under the x-axis is gonna flip around the um, x-axis and it's gonna be going up like that, okay? So again, it still looks like the X cubed, the little, the little um, S curve guy going on there, um, but <laughs> it's gonna end up with flipped around the X axis. So it starts at the top and ends up at the bottom. So when we talk in behavior, okay, um, let me put it over here. here. In behavior, When A is positive, okay, start at the bottom, end at the top, okay. When A is negative, okay, which we saw here, we start at the top and end at the bottom. Start at the top and end at the bottom. So it just absolutely flips it upside down, right? Sorry, I don't know why I'm writing cricket here. <laughs> all right. So, and then you say, well, if I add all that stuff behind it, then it's going to bounce around more. And so this guy will end up looking like, let me just all, I'll throw him out here. Y equals X to the third plus a bunch of junk. Okay. He may be way over here, not on the origin anymore, but he looks like that, okay? It's hard to see it in the original, the X to the third, because it just flattens out in the middle. We'll talk about that later. Why is it doing that, okay? But eventually, if I add a bunch of stuff to it, if it follows our rules, which it should, it's got an X to the third. That means it should go one, two, three directions, right? that in there, three directions. And if it follows the same polynomial rules that we had for the even guys, which it should, there should be one fewer than the number of directions turning points. So two turning points. And absolutely, it comes up, it hits this turning point, it comes down, it hits this turning point, and it goes up, it hits that turning point. Okay, so what we're going to end up doing is we will eventually say, okay, look here, we have 
um, a polynomial function. We know it's in behavior. We know it's starting at the bottom, going to the top. We don't know how much it's bouncing around in here in the middle, but we'll do some stuff to find things out. For instance, on this guy, I see there are x intercepts, right? One, two, three x intercepts, okay? So I should be able to find those or at least narrow them down, right, to where they are. This one, it only had the one X intercept at zero, zero, okay? That's because it's not bouncing around as much, so it's not got as much activity in the center, if that makes sense. It's not bouncing around as much because it doesn't have stuff added at the back of it, okay? So we'll end up seeing that happen, okay? Here, when I had the parabola that was just like this, I just had the one x-intercept. That one was easy to find because it's at the origin, zero, zero, okay? But it could have, let me, let me draw you a little parabola right here. It could have been shifted around enough so that it has two x-intercepts, right? And similar thing here with the, the x to the fourth, it could have up to four x-intercepts, okay? And if you're saying to yourself, hey, hang on a minute, my exponent here was a two, and you're, you're telling me it could have as many as two x-intercepts? Absolutely. That's not a coincidence, okay? The exponent tells me the maximal number of x-intercepts, okay? Now here for this x to the fourth guy, we only had two, okay? What that tells me is that some of those x-intercepts, there are still four solutions to this guy because I've got a four for the exponent. There are still gonna be four solutions, but just two of them aren't x-intercepts here, okay? they happen to be imaginary numbers and we'll see that later. Okay, there's, there's time for us to pick that stuff up. So in general, um, and by the way, I just did X to the third here, but any of these would have similar stuff, right? So if I had X to the fifth, it would, and it was positive, it would go up, down, up, down, up. And it would have a possibility of up to five X intercepts, okay? four turning points, five X intercepts. So here's some general stuff. Okay, polynomials can go different directions to match their exponent. And I'm gonna say leading exponent. Okay, leading just means the first guy you see, right? Once it's in a numeric order, okay, then the leading guy is the first one, just like the A is my leading coefficient, okay? So if you have Y equals X to the fifth, it could go five different directions. And it could have up to four direction changes or turning points. Okay. This is all determined by the leading exponent. That's what's important here. The leading exponent is what tells me all of this stuff. Okay, and it could have polynomials can have um, x intercepts to match their leading exponent okay so again in this case um for y equals x to the fifth up to five x intercepts 
Okay. Now that doesn't mean it has to have a it doesn't mean it has to have five. It means it could have up to five, which means there are going to be some that only have one x-intercept, like the one that was the original up here, right? Okay, this original guy, it could have just one x-intercept. It could have three x-intercepts, but if it's x to the fifth, it could have five x-intercepts. And we will talk about, it could have two x-intercepts. We'll talk about how these things happen and it has to deal with um, the roots or the solutions. So here's a here's us a, a, a little definition that we're gonna get in, okay? When we start talking about solutions of polynomials, your book at some point may call them roots. Okay, um, it's also sometimes called um, x-intercepts. And I feel like there's one more word for it. If I, if I come up with it, I'll, I'll throw it in. Um, but I feel like that sometimes you'll hear it called something else. Um, solutions and roots are a lot of what you'll be hearing them. But we know how to find an x-intercept, right? We know that in order to find an x-intercept, I just set the whole thing equal to zero, make your y be zero because x-intercepts happen. X-intercepts happen where I cross the x-axis, right? And that's where my y value, I didn't move up, I didn't move down, my y value equals zero, right? So that's what's happening here. The X has a value, I don't know, negative six or something, but the Y value is always zero for these X intercepts, right? So anytime I wanna do this, we've already talked about this before, I just find the X intercept, I set Y equal to zero and solve. Okay, so finding the solutions of these guys, finding the roots, finding the X intercepts, we can do this, okay? We've done these things before. And all of that will help us know what's going on in the inside of the graph. We know the end behavior. Okay, one more thing. Yeah, end behavior. We know the end behavior, but the what where there are x-intercepts, how it's going through the, the x-axis, that kind of stuff. Um, can help me tell what's going on in the middle. And eventually what we're going to do is we're going to just kind of sketch these graphs. We are not going to do anything crazy with them. We're just going to sketch them. And if we know what's going on in the center, great. And if we don't, then we just sketch it. It doesn't have to be perfect. We're going to do the best we can to get a general idea of what's going on inside of these guys. Okay, so in behavior is determined by the leading coefficient. Okay, and real quickly, let me graph a couple of these odd guys, and um, we will, because I don't think I, I, I graphed that, right? We see that going on, but let me see, what if I added some stuff? Okay, let me do it to the, the x cubed guy, because he's easier for me to play with, maybe. Minus 5x plus eight, let's just do that and see what happens. Oh, there we go. Oh, that was almost perfect. It went a little bit too high. Look at this. All I did was just barely change this y equals x cubed guy. I added just a little bit of stuff and it moved it up off. It's no longer in the origin, right? So it's no longer odd, but it's still gonna behave like an odd function. So here it goes, one, two, three. Okay, it went three different directions. I have two turning points, that's what I should have, but look here, how many x-intercepts? Just one, right? So just one turning point for this guy, uh, I'm sorry, one x-intercept. It's got two turning points, one x-intercept. So that's okay because the maximum x-intercepts is three, okay? It can have up to three, it doesn't have to have three. Okay, but that's the maximum. So can you see that if this had bounced enough and come back down here, it would have passed through the x axis again. And then to turn around and get back to my end behavior, it would have bounced there again. Okay. And again, one more little thing. Let me insert 
insert a negative there. What do we think that's going to cause it to do? Flip upside down, right? So this guy should be, oh, I'm not seeing him because somehow I've, something that I did moved him around. So let me zoom fit him and see what's going on. There we go. Ah, so the negative, we can see the overall in behavior. He started at the top and he's coming down. It's not bouncing as much now as it did a minute ago. So that's interesting because the negative has managed to kind of counteract some of the bouncing that I caused to happen whenever I added this stuff at the back, right? So, and it's always interesting to me because different things cause different stuff to happen. These are not our normal little shifts, right? I didn't put it in parentheses and all that. Um, I did add eight, the plus eight at the back. And if we put in a zero for X and a zero for X, we would have um, an X, or I'm sorry, a Y intercept of eight. So I can't really see it because it's kind of zoomed out funny. But if I went into the table here, I would see it, there it is. If X is zero, I get um, Y is eight. So that is my X intercept still. So that's great. It's just really tied in here, I can't see it. All right, so that's what's going on with these graphs. This is in general. We're gonna wanna do a, just a couple of little examples. I know I'm already reaching 30 minutes on my video. So give me just a second to get a couple of examples and we will do more concrete stuff so that you have some, some experience with it before you start looking at your homework. Ah, I just remembered that extra word. Okay, so the extra word for solutions of polynomials, I'm sorry, go back just a tiny bit in your note, is zeros, C-E-R-O-E-S, zeros. So sometimes your book may call them zeros of the function, and that's because that's where the Y equals zero, right? So I knew there was another word, ah, found it. Okay, so here we go. I've got an example. F of X equals X minus one squared times X plus three. And when I'm looking at this guy, um, they're, they're gonna ask me to do a few things, okay? So the first thing is I wanna know the degree. And that should be the total degree of the polynomial. So you're gonna need to be a little bit careful here because the degree is kind of hidden in this one. Okay, normally we'd have like y equals x to the fifth and we would just go from that. But see how they've already got this one kind of factored out for me. They're trying to be helpful and give me some factored stuff. But what's really going on, if I multiply this bit out, I would have x squared, right? And this guy has an X in it also, and these are being multiplied eventually. So what I've got is X squared times X going on here, okay? And the leading exponent is what I care about. I don't care about all the other stuff. You don't have to multiply this all the way out to see what's going on. But I know that this would eventually be X squared because this would be like X squared minus two X plus one or something when I multiply that out. And this would be a one X. So that means my overall degree of this polynomial is X to the third, okay? So this is a third degree polynomial, okay? I do know it's a polynomial looking at it or I'm pretty certain because this is a two and this is a one, right? Okay, so those are nice positive whole numbers. They are not negatives and they're not fractions. Okay, so I feel good about my degree. Okay, the other thing it's going to want to know is what's my leading coefficient? Because we need to know that to be able to decide all this other stuff, right? So this is just kind of like off to the side little notes. My leading coefficient. Well, again, that would be determined by if there was a number out here or if there was a number right in front of this X. If I had two X and then I'm gonna end up squaring that, that's gonna be end up being four X squared, right? So I gotta watch out for that, okay? But really more than anything, I'm looking for signs, positives and negatives, right? Cause that tells me the end behavior. So this is going to be X squared. This is gonna be X. And those are both positive. So it's gonna be a positive times a positive, and that's gonna give me a positive, okay? So I 
should know just a tiny bit about what's going on with this graph before I ever do anything with it. All right, and hopefully we do. So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, this is going to be a third degree polynomial. That's odd, right? And the basic look of him, he's positive. It's going to start at the bottom and it's going to go up like this. Okay, now it may be shifted around or something like that, but I don't know. It might bounce in the middle and stuff like that. But at the end, because he's positive, he's going to end up going like this, right? Okay, I don't know what's happening in the middle, but I can tell the end behaviors. Start at the bottom, end up at the top. So first off, let me just confirm that by using my calculator, and we're going to see what's going on. Okay, oops, I pushed the wrong button. There we go. All right, so we have parentheses, x minus one squared, okay? And then we're gonna multiply that by x plus three, okay? So I don't think I need any parentheses around this because my, x, my calculator should just do that exponent, just the two. If it gives me something weird, I'll, I'll change it, but. Okay, there we go. Let me see if I can zoom this one standard. It, it might show me a little more bounce. There we go. Okay, so the 10, negative 10 to positive 10 on your grid, positive 10 to negative 10, um, or I'm sorry, negative 10 to positive 10, it's always going to be the place you should start. Then if you need to zoom in, you can, um, but I'm going to start with this one. So yeah, that looks beautiful. It's a beautiful, um, um, third degree equation and it's starting at the bottom and it's ending up at the top. It's bouncing around in the middle. That's what we need to find out, okay, is how much is it bouncing? Um, do I know something about it? And so what they're going to ask me to do is find the zeros. Find the zeros. And again, you could say solutions or x-intercepts or whatever. So what we do to find the zeros is set this whole thing equal to zero. Zero equals x minus one squared x plus three. Now, the nice thing for this is they've already factored it for me. Yay, that's awesome. So they already factored it for me. I know whenever I have two things multiplied together that equal zero, I can set them each equal to zero x minus one squared equals zero, right? Or x plus three equals zero. So I'm basically gonna have two little equations going on here. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm putting this right in the middle like this, but I'm kind of stuck now, so here we go. All right, so um, the, the cool thing is the one on the right, we can solve this one, no problem, right? So you would subtract three, on both sides of the equation, and you end up with x equals negative three, okay? So that is definitely gonna be one of the x-intercept, right? And that's what we're finding here, okay? The other one is set up as a square. So remember that you need to square root both sides to get rid of that. So I square root over here and I square root over here. And whenever you do that, um, the, you, you technically have a plus or minus on this square root over here, but zero plus or minus is just zero. So we don't care about it, but the square and the square root are gonna cancel each other out, right? So what I have here is X minus one equals, and it's a plus or minus zero, but it's just zero, right? Okay, so there were, two, there was an exponent of two here, but now I've only got one solution coming out. So plus one, plus one, right? That gives me X equals one. That's one of my solutions or one of my X intercepts, okay? But because it had a two on it before, it's gonna do something that is called a multiple of two. Okay, or multiplicity, you'll hear it said that. And that's what it makes it end up doing something really interesting. So let's go back and look at this. We know that we should have an x-intercept at negative three and we should have an x-intercept at x equals one, okay? So here's my negative three. You could trace this guy if you want to. 
like you can see, okay, what's going on here? Boom, boom, right uh, past it, okay. Right here, I've got, it's not quite negative three, it's just a little bit off. Um, when it was there, it was negative three, it was negative. By the way, there's a really interesting um, theorem that we're gonna talk about later, probably not on this video, but it says, hey, look, this guy, my Y value was a negative, negative 3.19. This guy, my Y value is a positive, and that was where X equals negative 2.97. So there's a solution in between there. We know because we did the math, it's at negative three, right? There's a solution. So what it's basically telling me, if I toggle to the left, it was negative. If I toggle to the right of it, it's positive. You change signs on your Y value and this guy is smooth and continuous. I didn't pick up my pencil. That means I must have crossed the Y, or I'm sorry, the X axis. Okay, so when the y value changes from a negative to a positive or a positive and a negative, we must have crossed through. That's what it's telling me. And that makes sense, right? We went from negative values down here to positive values up here. Well, the guy that's between negatives and positives is zero, y equals zero. So there was indeed an x-intercept in there. Okay, and then let me come over here and try to see if we can find this spot right here. We know it should be positive one, okay? It's close, it's not quite, it's not quite giving me the positive one. The problem is on your calculator, it has pixels, so it has to like jump from one spot to the next. So it's not always pretty. There is a way for me to calculate those x-intercepts. We'll get that later um, if you're absolutely not sure, but I'd like for us to stick with mostly hand stuff right now. So right in there, we went right there. Okay, <laughs> almost to zero. So it's just because of the pixels on my calculator, I can't quite see it. But notice the difference. On this negative three guy, we passed through, but on this one, it like came down to the zero and bounced, okay? That's what multiplicity is going to do for me, okay? So here's, the, here's what happens. It's called multiplicity, okay? When you find your x-intercepts, you also need their multiplicity. Okay, which just means how many times does that solution happen? That's what that means. Okay, so and here we had um, if it's an odd number. Your graph passes through. The X intercept, I'm sorry, X axis. OK, and that's what happened here with X equals negative three. It only happened once. This was the solution that went with this factor right here where the exponent was a one. So we know it only happens once. OK. And look, it passed right on through, no problem. Now, if it happened to be like a multiplicity of three or a multiplicity of five or something like that, that's where we'll start seeing it flatten out there. That's why on the original X cubed, it comes up and it flattens out just a little bit because it only has that one X intercept, but that one X intercept is working three times. So it's got multiplicity of three. So it either passes like this or it may flatten out, but it still passes through if it's an odd multiplicity, okay? If it's an even number, oops, even number, your graph will bounce. Okay, and that's what's happening there. Okay, there's not a parenthesis, sorry. Your graph will bounce. So here we had multiplicity of two. Again, we know that because it came from this factor that had a two on the exponent that tells me whatever's going on in here is happening twice. Okay, so I had multiplicity of two on it, that's even. 
And sure enough, when we get right here, oops, sorry, when we get right here at x equals one, it comes down, it just barely touches that x axis and then it bounces right back up. Okay, so that's what we're going to know about multiplicity is um, once we see how many times that particular solution happens, we'll be like, oh, okay, cool. Um, now we need to, <laughs> to figure out is it going through or is it bouncing? So um, I have an example, but I see that I am way out of time. So here you go. Um, the example says, find the zeros and they spell that without an E in it. So I don't know which is correct. Sorry about that. Find the zeros and their multiplicity. And the equation is f of x equals five times x minus two times x plus three squared times x minus one half to the fourth. So let's do this super fast. We don't even have to really do much math for it. We just need to find the solution here. So this guy, if I took that x minus two and set it equal to zero, I would get what? x equals I'm hearing two in my head. What's the exponent on that set of parentheses? It's a one, right? So multiplicity one. That's odd. That means I'm gonna cross through the x-axis here, okay? How about x plus three equals zero? What happens there? That gives me x equals negative three. And I look and I say, that came from this guy right here. What's his multiplicity? And in my head, I hear you saying two. I know I hear a lot of stuff in my head. Okay. And the last one is x minus one half equals zero. And if you do that math, hopefully you see that x is going to equal one half. And what multiplicity is it? It's a big one. Multiplicity of four, right? So real quickly, I'm going to say this guy had a one on him. I didn't write him, but we know there's always a one up there. If nothing's written. This is a two. This is a four. The degree of this polynomial is four, five, six, seven. It's an odd function. So if you go ahead and graph this guy, keep it in the the factored out form, just put it into your calculator, you should end up with a degree seven guy, and that's going to act like an odd. The leading coefficient is positive out here, right? So um, this is going to be starting at the bottom and ending at the top, and then I know I've got three x intercepts, and a, this one's going to bounce, and this one's going to bounce, right? But this one's going to go through, so. Hopefully that helps us see what that's going to look like overall. Go plug it in your calculator and see what you think. All right. I'm way out of time. I'm sorry, um, but I hope that this helps. Thanks. Bye.